Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you very much for attending this 2022 Hydra Developer Bootcamp with Conflex and Chen IDE. I'm Bo from Chen IDE, and I will be the moderator today. Um, before we get started, I don't think it will be a problem, but please be respectful to each other in the chat room. And if you have a question, please type it into the comment box, and we'll select one or two questions if we still have extra time between each session. Okay, and I will do a briefly introduction on this event, and then we'll quickly move to the opening address for our bootcamp before the module one started. We all know that the blockchain industry started to boom rapidly in the recent years, and Conflex has become one of the most popular blockchains that enables creators, communities, and markets to connect across borders and protocols without barriers primarily thanks to its cutting edge technology and low fees transactions. So here we are. This bootcamp is organized around crypto, blockchain technology, and intensive developing courses for all level developers. The bootcamp intends to provide developers with design and hands-on experience of Solidity Grammar and smart contracts, as well as knowledge about create and launch your own blockchain project. To speak more precisely, this event will not only provide the introduction level courses, but aim to escort developers while gathering for them the resources from the ecosystem and life circle of the blockchain games and projects. These courses of bootcamp are designed on theory through practice and taught by instructors from the senior blockchain experts with practical expertise. Devoted campus will get the reward of exploring a blockchain project in its full life circle. And this is my great honor to announce that the 2022 Hydra Developer Bootcamp has officially started. Our first guest speech to the opening address is Ms. Xia Wu. He is the CEO of the White Matrix and founder of the Chain IDE. Mr. Xiao, you may start whenever you're ready. All right, thanks, Bo. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the High Drive Bootcamp. My name is Wu Xiao, but you can also call me Ling, which is my developer name. I'm the CEO of White Matrix. First of all, thank you very much for joining us. The High Drive Developer Bootcamp is proud to be one of the dev events created specifically for Web3 developers. We have ID developer activities and the ecosystem in more than 185 countries around the world. We have discovered that the blockchain industry has limited possibilities for expansion by pure blockchain technology from our community of developers. However, it is these groups of developers who have explored the ultimate possibilities of the blockchain technology. From 2017 to today, I have seen plenty of talented developers pull off amazing feats. We can imagine that such developers are the drivers of the blockchain world. And it is these same developers who will be the pathfinders of the whole Web3 world. As I said, I really appreciate the developers from different countries can connect through this event. We also love to co-build this bootcamp with our friends, Conflux Labs. We strive to support the blockchain ecosystem and grow together with the community. In this high drive bootcamp, we invite guests from both academic and industry areas. We hope to provide an insightful program over the next month. I hope you all enjoy this event. All right, thank you for the speech, Xiao. And the next honor guest is Chris. He is the global expansion manager from Conflex. And Chris, you may start whenever you're ready. Yes, perfect. Hey everyone, and thanks for the intro. And thanks again for Ling um, also from, for his introduction to today's event. Yeah, I'm Chris, and I'm the, the head of global expansions at Conflux Network. And today we're super, super happy that we're, we're, we're beginning this event in collaboration with Chain IDE, a very strong partner with you guys today to start this Conflux Labs um, workshop and hackathon um, for a month in Africa. Um, yeah, before further ado, I think 
we're just super happy to be here to have everyone on board and we're happy about all the registrations and we want to use this opportunity to learn more about um, potential developers learn more about you guys um, whoever is starting this and to 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 start your development journey into the web3 area now i'll talk about web3 a bit later um, but i think we're just super happy to get started, get going, and we'll be super excited for this strong month. And yeah, the, the cool thing is with Chain IDE and the integration that we have, that you don't need to download anything on your computer and you can just do it from a web browser anywhere you are um, to make it even more simple for everyone out there who is interested in Web3 and blockchain development. Yes, thanks. All right, thank you very much for your speak, Chris. And we will now move to the module one for our bootcamp course. The first topic is from blockchain to metaverse from Mr. Xiao Wu. Mr. Wu, you may start whenever you're ready. Xiao, I'm the CEO of White Matrix. Today, my topic is from blockchain to metaverse. I will start with a brief self-introduction to you. So. You guys can know me a bit more. I'm currently the director of Yangtze River Blockchain International Innovation Center and the CEO of White Matrix. I pursued my bachelor's and master's degrees at the University of Alberta from 2009 to 2015. In 2019, I collaborated with Dr. Wei Cai and our manuscript and interoperable avatar framework across multiple games and blockchains was accepted to the top rank conference IGP Infocom. In 2020, I was awarded the first prize in the China Blockchain Development Contest. I also do some research in the field of blockchain, and I have been invited to give public lectures and seminars at many universities. So, um, last but not least, I'm also a coder. Yeah, I still write code and a dev designer. I have created several dev games, and I have extensive experience designing smart contracts. Okay, that's enough about me. Next, I will tell you some cool things about White Matrix. So White Matrix is a technology company that specializes in the research and development of blockchain middleware and the global developer ecosystem. Chain ID, which was developed by White Matrix, is a cutting edge cloud-based blockchain integrity development environment that supports blockchain ecosystem, such as Ethereum and Binance Smart Chain. And White Matrix has raised five rounds of financing, total around $15 million from several companies, including Ad Group and Hashkey. And let's talk a little bit about Chain ID. Chain ID enables users to quickly invoke, query, develop, and deploy the underlying blockchain system services through simpler settings and commands. As of November 2021, ChainID has assisted the developers in more than 185 countries with over 8.5 million smart contracts, compilation services, and 70 million blockchain middleware flows worldwide. As the main flow entrance, ChainID intends to facilitate developers to explore new territories in the world of blockchain for easier flows and more innovations. Up till now, ChainID supports Facebook Diam, Unchain, Ethereum, physical vehicles, and the term more significant blockchain infrastructure. And yeah, we are proud of the global developer ecosystems that we have developed. We offered free eight weeks comprehensive course on masterclass to develop across 40 countries in Africa, thus establishing a connection with the local developers and communities on the continent. The masterclass course has a view count of more than 100,000 on YouTube and has helped more than 1,000 African blockchain developers, thus incubating more than 15 blockchain projects. We co-host the BMDS 2021 webinars with the University of Alberta to explore issues relating to data science of blockchain and multimedia. Professors from University of British Columbia, University of Alberta, and the Chinese University of Hong Kong Shenzhen, and the industry experts from Citibank, White Matrix, 
Best Buy and Alta ML jointly held a three-day sem three seminar with more than 30 students' projects on display. We also present our technology and developer ecosystem to G20 Young Entrepreneurs Alliance. We, also, we, we have also made many connections with thousands of smart contract designers in Indonesia and Singapore. We continuously exert ourselves at building up a worldwide blockchain developer ecosystem with the belief that the developers will bring out countless innovations and practical applications to this industry. Next, I want to talk about NFTs and Metaverse today. The cute kitties you see now are called crypto kitties. Wait a minute. I think there's some noise. I'm not sure where it comes from. Okay, never mind. The cute kitties you see now are called crypto kitties. This was the first step in the world that allowed people to have a cat on the blockchain. The technology behind this cat is called ERC721. It is a standard for creating and trading NFTs on the Ethereum blockchain. Sorry, okay. CryptoKitties was widely successful, and after that, NFTs boomed in the world. And there's a one sentence I should say, big names are hyped about NFTs. So one recent example is the Olympics NFT made by NW Play and Flow, which is the official NFT collections for Tokyo 2020. IOC published the Olympics Heritage Collections NFT in 2021 on June 17th. The main theme is traditional Olympics arts and design. They are split into common, real, epic, legendary four levels and different prices, I think. I also go there and buy. I try to use USDC and Visa to buy these NFTs. And all of these NFTs are sold out within 24 hours, I think, at the first pre sale. Yeah. We also have seen TikTok publish an NFT announcement in the New York Times. Facebook changed its name to Meta and become a Metaverse company. Microsoft said all tech companies will get into Metaverse and show the world their Metaverse project mesh. There are too many cases, and I will use the rest of time to try to answer three questions. The first one is, why do we need the Metaverse? So to answer this question, I first want to introduce what the Metaverse is. Metaverse was coined in Neil Stephenson's 1992 science fiction novel, Snow Crash, where humans as avatars interact with each other and software agents in a 3D dimension virtual space that use the metaphor of the real world. Uh, the novel is really interesting, but it is very sick and take time to finish reading. The, 2020, uh, the 2018's uh, film, Ready Player One, is a great visual interpretation of the metaverse. So why do we need the metaverse? Let's think deeper about this question. It is a well-known fact that the resource on Earth are limited. Many of our visitors have tried to find new market in the past hundred years. If not, there are cruel battles and conflicts for the innovative uh, market. I think now there are a word called involution is very popular online. I mean, there are a lot of involved market. They, they have cruel battles and conflicts and even wars in both business side and political sides. Yeah. Uh, now I want to explain, yeah, the, in the age of exploration, the European seafarers try to convince the king to give them money so they could build the ships and explore the sea. They also have brought some rumors, such as the city of gold. Uh, if they can find the city of gold, all the European people will be wealthy. I think this is one way they try to find a new market. Of course, we know they didn't find the city of gold, yeah. But they did find a mar new market in the end. New trading roads was, were established and many new opportunities arose. 
Many people my age may have played a game called Uncharted Waters. The game is set in the age of is set in the age of explorations. Now the story also continues. I mean, we see the SpaceX and the exploration of the space. The goal is kind of similar. If we can find a new ter terrestrial uh, planet, then all of the people in the, on the Earth will be kind of happy. So some friends will say, okay, I agree with your point, but why, uh, why most people are happy in the past decades? We feel global recessions when coronavirus happened, but before that, everything seems cool. This is because, the, this is because of the internet boom. We have had uh, we have had in the past decades. Mm, we have seen a lot of big names come out of the boom, such as Google, Microsoft, and Amazon. Now these big companies have access to the international market, and they provide services worldwide. This is also a brand new market, and most international companies boomed in the last few decades. And nowadays, many. Uh, many internet companies also feel anxiety and looking for have a new area. This is because the internet services have already connected everywhere, which means there will be battles for the involute market again nowadays. So if we want to create an everlasting new market, what will we do? So as I write in, as I written in this uh, PPT from limited to unlimited, we need a paradigm shift. To move from a limited market to an unlimited market, uh, this is where the metaverse come from. Come in, I think, yeah. The metaverse can create unlimited experience with really low marginal cost, which is cold. If you can create a metaverse, it can provide billions of people with knowledge, opportunities to collaborate, entertainment and the, the real world will only need to generate electricity. This will create an incremental market because we can create everything with code in the metaverse. In the recent years, there haven't been any significant techno technical breakthrough and the world is unstable again. We see tense situation between countries and a turbulent world economy. This implies that we are in a global recession now. We really need to build the metaverse to create an incremental market. And in the metaverse, code is kind of miracles with endless possibilities. The second question will be, why does the metaverse need blockchain? So for the blockchain, I still agree with the economist published the article named The Promise of the Blockchain in 2015, I think, 2015. It tells about the operating logic behind Bitcoin and blockchain and what role this trust machine can play in the future. I agree with this article and we will start from this point. Now, there are two kinds of metaverse in the world. So we all agree that we need to build the metaverse but the key question is which type of the metaverse do we want to build? The first one is just like Tencent proposed. It is a lifelike virtual reality on the internet. I think most big companies want, companies want to build this type of metaverse. This kind of metaverse is immersive and lifelike, but it is still controlled by the big names. There's one example I can use to explain this point. No matter how realistic this kind of metaverse is building, you probably cannot play the games from their competitors in this metaverse. This is just a closed system. If you want to use another application from another company, you need to log out and use another platform. And the other, the other kind of metaverse is a blockchain-driven metaverse. In, this, in, in the blockchain industry, everyone is connected. There is a distributed ledger that contains all of your cryptocurrency transaction data. There are smart contracts that have Turing complete logic and store your game assets such as NFTs. All dApps can get in, in and, uh, and know your information about your NFTs and your equipment can be used in multiple games and applications. This is a huge difference a blockchain-driven metaverse is open, interoperable, 
and connected. The third question will be how we build the metaverse. Here I propose three elements to get the genesis of the metaverse. The first element is perception layer. So the perception is a layer we perceive the metaverse. There are a lot of opportunities in this area, such as VR, AR, MR, game engine, ray tracing algorithms, rendering algorithms, and the brain computer interface, and etc. There are a lot of things at the peak opportunities in this kind of layer. Now the second one is regulation. This is the layer that blockchain should jump in. In this open connected metaverse, all the main rules should be transparent and auto executed. If there is no blockchain involved, we can only build isolated world with closed ecosystem, close ecosystems. I mean, blockchain means Web 3.0, means open source native, means connected. Every code, every code in the block, on the blockchain may be written in solidity and cadence, everything is open and you can see every sources of the code. This is beautiful. And for the third part, mass production, I always think the mass production should be, I mean, in the before, I, I think the mass production should be 5G, 6G, IoT, edge computing for something. Now I realize, I really believe the mass production should be UGCs and AIGCs. In the future, AI will help us generate fantastic metaverse and we can learn, we can create, and we can enjoy the endless world in the metaverse. Next, I want to show you some metaverse projects nowadays. We go back and we see, so for, we have TikTok published an NFT announcement in the New York Times. This one is really interesting because we know TikTok is really big names and they try to do, act like, like an internet com company, but why they try to decentralize themselves? I think that this is related to some punishment from the US government. And they also want to try to use NFTs to connect it more creators and the, 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 the YouTubers, I think. And we also have Meta and we have Nash. And behind TikTok, they try to build the NFT systems. We have immutable apps. So this one is very interesting. I think in the future, many blockchain projects and blockchain teams will collaborate with some centralized big names such as TikTok. This is the first case I want to show you is the collaboration between TikTok and Immutable X. The second one is Metaverse Soul. I mean, this is a really centralized cities and they, they love Metaverse. They want to build the realistic Metaverse. But in this case, they didn't have the blockchain driven Metaverse at first, I mean, at, at present, they, at present, they didn't have the blockchain driven metaverse. But what they want to provide is a metaverse social services, such as uh, metaverse journey and metaverse city views, education, and something about that. And this one is uh, one approach from the centralized world, try to build the metaverse and show their city to the, the world. And the next example is really interesting. This one is kind of city DAO. We all know Miami try to issue their Miami tokens and all the citizens in Miami will get the profit from uh, the, 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 the proof of work of Bitcoins because they try to uh, get the Bitcoins, mint the Bitcoins uh, as a city site. And they will have their tokens and on this news, in this news, you will see the mayor of Miami try to explain what they are doing and uh, explain the, the, all the things to their citizens that we will go to generate more Bitcoins and we will share that with all of you and you will have your tax returns, you will have your education and even your medical healthcare with blockchains and USDCs uh, and US dollars. The next uh, case will be Flow and NBA Top Shot. So Flow is the company that they build uh, CryptoKitties. Recording stopped.
As I mentioned, this is uh, uh, the first step in the world. After that, they build several interesting depths such as Cheese Wizard and also NBA Top Shot. Nowadays, uh, if, you are fan, in progress. if you are a fan of NBA, you can try to get the NBA Top Shot NFTs on Flow's ecosystems. And lots of NBA uh, star, superstars, they also try to sell the NFTs to their fans. And I think the revenue is really good. They generated about a hundred million, a hundred million, a hundred million US dollars in one month uh, when, when everyone are hyped about the NFTs. The next example I want to show you is some blockchain driven metaverse. So for Sandbox, for Decentraland, for Crypto Voxels, they are kind of the blockchain driven metaverse. All their NFTs, I mean their lands, they are a kind of a beacon on the blockchain. And usually, uh, I mean, yeah, I, I think at, most of them, I mean, all of them, they are written in Solidity and their NFT lands, they are kind of ERC721, the similar, the exactly the same standard with the CryptoKitties, as I mentioned. And these are some metaverse uh, projects that has already come out. And also we have some new blockchain metaverse projects uh, boomed this year. For example, Matrix World, it is also our best friends and in our ecosystems, we try to help them to build their Turing complete metaverse and everyone there can cope and they can connect their dApps in different ecosystems, such as the, the developers in Flow can try to interact with Ethereum steps and also the friends in Ethereum's ecosystem can try to buy NFTs from Flow side. What they use is the, the, the middleware technology that can interact with different blockchains. And also we see some Blocktopia is very popular recently. We see some 3D immersive blockchain driven metaverse boom this year. And these are some cases, and I just want to try to give you a general idea about the metaverse because I know the following structures are uh, more professional than me, and they will give you much more details about the metaverse. And this is here is my topic today. Thank you very much. All right, thank you for um, the speak. Uh, Ms. Wu, and we have a question for you here. Um, the question is, how Web3 and Metaverse concepts will change people's life in Africa? Okay, so uh, Web3 and Metaverse is really hype recently. In Web3, we often say Wagami, which means we are gonna make it. We as Web3 people believe the blockchain-driven Metaverse is the future. So let's talk about some real opportunities, I think. So the first one is NFTs. So Africa has many amazing culture and arts. Devs can build computational arts and mint them as NFTs. We see BIYC and Azuki these days. I think there are still a lot of opportunities in this area. The second one may be the metaverse and also the, the UGC contents. I mean, metaverse can create immersive models and contents. If people want to play or learn in more attractive ways, that will be a chance. The third one is DAO. So DAO is amazingly huge. Uh, DAO will change everything, I mean, and it is still at a very, very st early stage. I think this change, uh, this will change human business history. For example, if a company want to hire people from 10 different countries, that will be really expensive. They need social welfare and also tax info. It will be much easier to bring them into a DAO. This will form the future collaborations. It can be a game guild, for example, people gathered and we play games. And also it can be a research DAO or a coder DAO, just like what we do, and we build things together. I mean, we see all Web3, all Web2 people will onboard with Web3, just like, just like I mentioned, we are gonna make it, yeah. Okay, uh, thank you for your elaboration. And let's move to the next uh, guest, Chris. And Chris will share us something of uh, information about Conflex Network. And Chris, you may start whenever you're ready. And yes, hopefully, as mentioned, we're all gonna make it. Wagmi 
um, the, the short thing you'll see in the internet around crypto Twitter and all the um, crypto communities out there. Um, that's definitely something you shouldn't be, yeah, unfamiliar with this term. And yeah, today I would like to talk a bit about Conflux Network and then give you some more input on, on Web3 and what, what is Web3 and what categorizes it. Um, so you all can have more ideas throughout this journey on, on what you can build based on what you've learned throughout the journey, right? Um, let's begin with Conflux. Um, by the way, this is Confi. This is our mascot. Um, I'm, I'm not sure. Hopefully we can send some to, to Africa and share them with the people who are participating in the Conflux Labs event. Um, yeah. And there are also NFTs of him, um, as we mentioned just now. Um, yeah. So, so Conflux started back in 2018 as a research project um, to see how Bitcoin, the Bitcoin consensus can be scaled because it's limited to four to seven TPS, right? And, and back then when it was created, the idea of it to, to become a decentralized and fully functioning financial system across the world was okay when not so many people were using it. But as it's gaining traction throughout the world and the need of it is getting higher and higher, um, we cannot be limited by this by the current throughput. And from this idea, um, Conflux Network was born, right? Because our founders were able to, on a technical basis, to advance the existing protocol, the existing algorithm, and to boost it up to a level where, where we can match the transaction speeds of Visa or MasterCard, which are currently the biggest players in the international payment industry and can serve all the needs from people nowadays. Um, so from the realization, uh, from the idea generation to the realization um, were many steps that and, and obstacles that we, we had to hurdle. But if you want to build a protocol, um, you need to do fundraising. And back then it was 2018. And if you guys look back into history, it was a very, very um, bear market year for the crypto industry. They call it also the crypto winter. Um, and we were able to, to fundraise 35 million and then start our scaling journey to hire more people and to bring out the idea and spread, spread it to the world. Um, back in 2020, which is now one and a half years ago, on the 29th of October, um, we launched our first official mainnet called Conflux Thesis. And since then, we have building the ecosystem, we have promoting it, we have been expanding to new places, to new regions. And just recently, last month, we have launched Conflux Hydra, which is our latest version. And the cool thing about that is um, that with Conflux Hydra, there's a new space on Conflux Network that's called Conflux eSpace. Um, which is more familiar to, to all the Solidity or blockchain developers that are out there that have been developing something on top of Ethereum, right, or BSC or Horby Smart Chain. Um, and it will be easier for, for, for everyone to not only deploy on top of Conflux, but also for the users um, to use Conflux Network with existing methods that they have learned and got used to over the years. For example, using a wallet like MetaMask and, and having the same wallet address standard that you have on Ethereum, and it will all be um, usable on top of Conflux. And with this eSpace, it will be also easier and quicker to connect to our networks, right? Because the blockchain network, as we see now, is a multi-chain network um, where multiple protocols are coexisting and where the money or the crypto assets can go freely around them. Now, a uh, very basic concept for, for, whom, for everyone who's listening and very new to crypto, um, wh wh what is a permissionless blockchain like Conflux Network? The easiest analogy 
would be that it's a Mac OS or a Windows system for the blockchain industry, for cryptocurrencies, um, on top of which you can build existing applications. In this case, we call them decentralized applications. Um, they work a bit differently, but the good thing is you don't, a lot of the things that you need in traditional um, development or especially web de web two development, um, you don't need them in blockchain any in the blockchain network anymore because they're all recorded on top of the blockchain. Um, yes, and from from Conflux Network, I want to talk a bit about the expansion of Conflux Network as well. Um, the idea started off in China, and it's a very interesting and controversial topic um, to talk about blockchain or cryptocurrencies in China. But I'm happy and proud to say that Conflux Network is the only publicly endorsed public blockchain in China. And this is also the reason why we have an application center in Hangzhou. We have a tech center, tech hub in Beijing. And we also have an office in Shanghai, where I'm currently in. But Public blockchains are not limited to one specific region. The, the, the whole concept of it, of blockchain technology, is to make it accessible for everyone. And with this ethos, we started expanding our community and our visions um, back in 2019 to Vietnam, to Indonesia, to South Korea, to Bangladesh, to Russia, and also to Africa where we're happy to be working with our um, regional lead, Ihis, whom you will also be seeing today. And that's a brief introduction about Conflux Network. I'm sure you guys will learn a bit more about Conflux, and you can always join our community if you have any questions um, from a tech side or from any other aspects of it. Now, I want to talk about the, the, the concept of Web3, right? Um, if you have Web3, you will also have Web1 and Web2. So now let's just have a quick recap of what Web1 and Web2 is. Um, what Web1 was back in the days, and there's a high possibility that some of you guys aren't even aware of it, is that the internet was read-only, right? It goes even back before that. But what this means is you could access websites from everywhere in the world with information that you can read, right? It's like a newspaper, right? You can read it, but you can't essentially share information or write anything on top of it that changes it. And then came Web2. One of the most the prominent examples would be Facebook launch, right? Now you could start commenting, you could write, um, WordPress came out, other blogs came out, MySpace came out, um, you were able to to create content and publish it on the web, right? But so it turned from web one, read only, to web two, read and write. But the one flaw that was there, and I'm sure you're all aware of, is the, the privacy and the ownership of the data, right? If you write something on, on Facebook or, or My, MySpace or share a video on TikTok, do you own it? Does it belong to you? Do you have the rights to it? Right, and the, over the last couple of years, you had the Cambridge exposure um, with Facebook, and you saw that what all these um, mega companies were doing with the data and essentially harming its user, right, by selling it to other people. And now comes Web three. Now you can read, write, and own. Right, o ownership is one of the biggest features of Web three. And like I said, participants have full ownership of their content data and the assets. Um, it's like you will always have your bank account with you on your phone everywhere you go to in the world, right? Um, you're the only one who has access to it unless you give it to someone else, but you do not have to give it to, to, to a bank that can deny you access to it. It happened back in 2008. Um, with all the financial crisis. And I think that's also something super important. Um, one of the, the main things for me personally, why I joined crypto and web and, and blockchain technology was 
I was living in Germany and people still use cash, right? And until today they use cash and the adoption of new tech is very, very slow. Then I came to China and in China, people were not or, or are not bringing their wallets with them anymore. There is no more cash. I think small kids that are growing up right now, they, they might have never, might haven't even seen cash in their lives before, don't know what to do with it because everything is on their phone. Right. It, it's so fast. It's 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 simple. I just send it to you, have a QR code and done. And it goes everywhere, everywhere you go to um, in a supermarket, you pay with it. You just scan it and you're done. You want to order something online. You don't have to use your credit card or anything. You do it via your phone and Web3 and cryptocurrencies will enable this all around the world. Um, in the future and it belongs to you. And I think that's something very important in the age of Web3 and in a time where everyone should be thinking about um, data ownership and privacy of your online data. Now, Web3, as, as mentioned, it includes Metaverse and NFT. And we had a very good example in our previous talk, but it does not only include metaverse and web threes, right? It's about all users' ability to fully own their data and use it as they wish, whether it's their NFT or their crypto assets or their blog posts on decentralized posting websites to further maybe monetize it without a middleman who, who is not transparent about what they're doing, right? It's about products that are for everyone and not limited to any region. Um, that anyone with an internet connection can have access to. And besides NFTs and, and Metaverse, I want to talk about DeFi a bit, right? Because with crypto and the concept of, of Bitcoins, as you all know, you'll have a store of value that belongs to you and that you can use. But with, De uh, with DeFi, decentralized finance, you can use it in a way that that at, where everyone can use it and and it can be more public and shared it can be a shared good where you're inputting your 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 bitcoins into or your ethereum or your usdt right because you want to not only to hold it but you also want your assets to work for you so you can use them in defi and there are so many unlimited possibilities that you can do there. You can also just simply do use crypto for remittance purposes. And I think that the decentralized finance is not limited to what you can see nowadays. Um, may it be Compound or Aave, where it's a lending protocol or it's a swap. It can be anything that you think of. Maybe there's something in your mind where you, where you have occurred this problem and think that it, it's a big problem um, but with DeFi, you can change it and you can do whatever you want with it and i i'm sure that over the next couple of weeks we'll also have sessions talking about DeFi, so you all um, joining this event can learn from it and maybe come up and hopefully come up with your own, own ideas um, remittance is a big topic um, that's especially seen in africa because that's where the biggest uh, volumes of Bitcoin remittance are in the whole world, right? But the more people, the, the, if you look at the leadership when it comes to using Bitcoins for remittances, you have Kenya and Nigeria in the top five. And that's, that's out there for a long while already. And I'm sure that you guys have your own perfect reasons for that. Um, then we can talk about something that's more related to metaverses and we have touched upon this as well before it's the gamify right game finance and there were great examples over in, in especially in the last year for example with um with sorry the, the name um last year where essentially people could earn a living from playing games right it, it sounds good it sounds nice. Um, it can be also demanding and stressing, but it's an alternative way of, of 
people earning an income and living off of it, right? And that's something that maybe couldn't have been yeah, imaginable a couple of years ago. And it's so simple, it's so fast. You'll get your earnings in crypto and then you can change it. But the cool thing on top of that is um, if, if you're in a game or you're using Steam and you want to switch an item with someone else, it might be super troublesome. You need to open an, an extra account. You need to list it on the marketplace. And most of the GameFi projects, they will have it integrated. And it's just two simple clicks without signing up anywhere. And you can change your items for someone else. Or you can also just simply sell them way easier than before. And one of the last things I want to talk about is our NFTs. Um, you, you might know NFTs from yeah, CryptoPunks or Board AB Yacht Club. Um, they're essentially just a very, very expensive profile picture that gives you entrance into a new community and a status, right? But NFTs are not limited by it. Um, if any one of you thinks back 20 years ago, if you wanted to board a plane, ride a bus, right, um, take a train, um, you, you would need to have a physical card that's printed out with your name on it, um, all the information that you can board the bus. Over the years, it has changed into a digital form, not everywhere, but in many places. Um, now you can also board planes um, just by scanning a QR code. And NFTs can replace that, right? They can document that. They can, NFTs are essentially immutable digital forms that you can also use for other things. It can be a concert ticket, it can be a bus ticket, it can be a plane ride. Um, it could be an entrance into a club that you always like to go to. Um, it's not limited to, to the, the, the profile picture that many are thinking of. It is already used in games, right? Your avatar can be the NFT. And if you're fed up with the game, you can sell it to someone else. Um, and I think NFTs are a great way of also showing and bringing the culture you're from to a bigger audience. Now, there are many African artists that are already in the NFT space and selling their NFTs online. And hopefully we can take that out and take it a notch up because in Africa, you have so many different cultures um, that's uncomparable to other places in the world. And each culture has their own style of art and NFTs or the metaverse are the perfect place to present it. But maybe you want to be more related to DeFi or, or remittance and blockchain technology and this course gives you a basic idea of how you can use crypto, how you can develop such an idea yourself. And I'm super happy that we have invited um, very, very prominent um, yeah, leaders of the crypto space in Africa, like Chuta, Osamede, Francis, and who will be sharing information about their product, about their vision, about crypto, how it changed their lives, how they changed it, so you can get inspired throughout this course while learning it. Thank you very much. And I hope you all have a great journey over the next four months, uh, sorry, one month, and can, yeah, have fun while building. Thank you very much. Well, thank you for a great talk, Chris. Um, we have one question here for you. And the question is, what has been the toughest challenge you have faced in the industry so far and how conflicts could break the barriers to solve them? Hmm. I think that, that that's a great, great question. Um, I, one of the biggest problems is, yeah, is adoption of, of blockchain technology, right? I'm sure that so many people out there, they, they've heard of, Bitcoin, they've heard of NFTs, um, they've heard of, 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 yeah, these two things like crypto and NFTs, but they don't know how to use it. Or the, the first single place of access would be a centralized server um, where they just hold it as an asset 
that can go up or down, but they don't know about what is behind it, right? The DeFi behind it, the, um, what you can do with NFTs, how you can run a decentralized organization using blockchain technology and then put a paradigm shift into the company as we know today that is located somewhere in a single place and led by a bunch of people. Um, I think adoption of crypto, crypto and blockchain is one of the biggest things. And as for Conflux, we're proud to say that we have done many courses um, to, the, um, to a big audience um, like today with Chain IDE, where we are organizing these courses to teach people not only about development, but also about what blockchain technology is and, and how it can be implemented to change the future or the world as we live in, because we truly believe that in 10 to, or, or in the next couple of years, blockchain technologies will be everywhere, regardless of whether we know it or not. Just like we're using the internet, but no one's thinking about, okay, are we using um, IP version six or IP version five? Right. will be embedded in, in the things we're using on our daily basis. Yeah. Okay. Thank you for your answer. And thank you for your time again, Chris. And our third speaker is um, Osamate. And he is the founder of um, GIGX. And welcome, Osamate. You may start whenever you're ready. Awesome. Sounds good. It's an absolute pleasure to be here today. Um, so I'm going to try to share my screen and then we're going to have uh, start our conversation. Okay. I'm not sure if the slide is showing up yet. Awesome. Awesome. Okay. Okay, once again, um, thank you for the opportunity to be here. Uh, so today I wanna to share something that I'm, I'm very uh, passionate about. And even as a, as a company, JIGX is uh, something that we're absolutely passionate about. And it's the idea of an opportunity of a lifetime. I think right now in history, uh, we all have a unique opportunity, a, a positioning to be able to design uh, the future. And I think that that's something that even as developers, uh, you know, it's like the, the Christ-like ability. Uh, so, so, so something that, you know, th that we take very seriously, something that I think that us having this conversation today uh, is very important because it will impact uh, the rest of the world. Uh, but before I go on, I think it is important that uh, for us to truly understand the future, it's very important that we understand the past. So we're going to talk a little bit about the past. I know a lot of the speakers today, uh, Mr. Wu, Mr. Chris, they've talked a lot about blockchain, cryptocurrency, they've talked about NFTs. So we're going to go pretty much similar circle. We're going to talk about the past, uh, where we're coming from, and where we could potentially go, and where you and I play a role in terms of actually uh, shaping this future. Okay, so a little bit about myself, I am uh, one of the co-founders for GIGX. I currently uh, sit as the COO, uh, operating officer for the organization as well. So I've been in the crypto space for about six years now, been an early investor in a number of projects, uh, including Binance, Helium, Matic. And um, I've, I've watched the space grow over the last six years. And it's something that has also uh, transformed my life. But what we're most excited about is the next 10 years, right? What we get to create and how we get to onboard the rest of the world into this environment. And we'll talk more uh, about that. So. Talking about the opportunity of a lifetime, I think it's important that we sort of recognize that every generation has been presented a form of opportunity to shape that generation, right? So there's always an opportunity in every generation. It doesn't matter if we look at the days of the horse and buggies, right? We went from horses on the roads to automobiles on the road, right? It doesn't matter if we look at the invention of electricity and how that has shaped the world that we live in today. Right. It doesn't matter when we look at the, you know, the, the early 90s or the, the late 80s with the inventions of personal computers, where everyone had an access to one of these devices that they started to rebuild the world with. Right. Uh, it doesn't matter when we look at things like software. These were opportunities that shaped that generation. 
uh, when we look at things like smartphones, the, the early 2000s, right? Uh, you know, I mean, it revolutionized everything. When we look at the internet, uh, we look at companies today like Amazon, we celebrate companies today like Facebook. I mean, a lot of the speakers talk about Meta, right? Um, the internet essentially was that opportunity that shaped that generation. So I, I think it's very important that when we look at the world, it's important to identify that indeed every generation truly is presented an opportunity to actually shape and evolve uh, for the next one. Now, I think more than ever before, uh, the opportunity that we have in this generation uh, is the opportunity of the blockchain. Now, the blockchain, what is the blockchain? So again, at the end of the day, I think it's very important that we understand what a thing is and then it's easier as creatives for us to think about ways to leverage it and think about ways to build on it, right? To, to shape the new world. So the blockchain at its core, right? Again, a lot of us here are, you know, you probably already know this, but for just to keep it very simply and plainly, it's a public distributed database, right? Uh, I mean, we're all familiar with databases or the world already is familiar with databases, but prior to now, a lot of these databases have been uh, very private, right? They, they've been private database. So think about the banks, think about, uh, you know, even your national identification systems or voting or things like that. Think about all of these databases that existed prior to now have typically been uh, private. And those also, you know, brings about challenges here and there. But, but the beauty about blockchain is that it is public and it is distributed. So public meaning that everyone can have access to it. And why that's important is that that bridges it bridges the issue of trust. I think in the world today, trust is probably one of the biggest challenges we've been trying to solve for centuries, right? And we're going to look at some of these applications. But it's that idea of trust. Even when we look at money, how do I trust that you say you're going to do what you're going to do, right? So we've always relied on third parties, right, to bridge that trust gap. And I think what the blockchain is doing for us today is allowing us to build trust, to bridge the trust gap with public databases. That's the aspect of public. The aspect of distributed, now there is no single fail point. So unlike a centralized system where there's a single fail point and it's easier for people to hack or for it to go down and then sort of, you know, the world gets into to trouble, but with a distributed database, not only is, not only is the fact that we're bridging this gap situation, but we're also doing it in a way that is immutable, it's in a way that uh, there's multiple of this database, multiple of these ledgers spread across the world. So if one of them was down, guess what? Operation will just continue because there's it's, it's available in other uh, other forms in other 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 areas. So that's the, the, the base about you know the blockchain. And the idea again is that we are it's, it's a tool that helps us to bridge trust. Now where is this important? Let's look at, again, a little bit about history of money, because it's very important, at least for me, when I look at concepts, we have, we have to sort of look at how does that concept play a role? What problems is solving and how can we take it to the next level? And I think that one of the very clear places where we see the need for trust, historically speaking, has been in the area of money, right? So, I mean, when we look at the, the history or, or like I'll say the evolution of money, uh, we started with the batter system right where you know i i have an item you have an item and we sort of swap and you know we went from butter system to using other items things that are more uh you know measurable in a sense right so items like calories rubber across the world it was represented by different uh, items and we moved from that to precious metals gold silver right gold came to mint this coins in their in their image and you know, it was one of the most universally accepted means of, uh, you know, exchange. And because at the end of the day, I think money really is two things. It's a store of value and it's a medium of exchange. So and for anything to serve as money, first, enough people have to agree that it is money. But I think beyond that, right, it has to be a medium of exchange uh, in terms of a store of value, right? And it has to be a way that we have to be uh, to track that value. Uh, that's what gold represented for, for, for many of most of uh, the you know early centuries, and then we moved on to paper money, which initially was backed by gold, and now we have fiat. It's a story for another day. But the point is that historically speaking, we have seen how uh, humans have tried to bridge this trust gap, and humans have tried to define value and exchange of that value. I think we're 
a, a time in the world today where this value is being uh, sort of defined in a new way, right? This digital way, this digital world. But again, there's all these challenges again of trust and, and things like that, right? And I think that that's where Bitcoin initially being one of the the, the I guess the the first mainstream application of blockchain in terms of uh, you know as a currency or um, you know, store of value and a medium of exchange where it comes into place. Because at the end of the day, if we really look at it, right, what is Bitcoin? What made it so effective was at, the, at its core really was a digital payment system. But again, digital payment systems are not new. Uh, you know, the only difference was that, or well, one of the differences is that Bitcoin for the first time allowed humans to transact value, to store value without the need of a trusted middleman. Because we've always looked at history, how there's always been this middleman and this idea of bridging trust. But for the first time, Bitcoin technology or Bitcoin networks are able to leverage blockchain. And why is this important? Because you might, might be like, oh, I already know what this is, but it's important for us to understand the application because it, as, as developers, for us to build the future, we could take these simple concepts and build on it. Because literally, when you look at it, it's a payment system that is built on a distributed ledger. So now you and I can transact value. You, know, you and I can send value from place to place without a middleman, but we have trust because the, 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 the database is public. We can all access it. We could all see it, right? And that's the beauty about Bitcoin. Again, it adds to the point that, again, it, it was a pre-programmed uh, sort of money, right? It was free of government control. It was easy to transfer safely and cheaply. I mean, think about the idea of doing a wire today. A typical wire will cost you anywhere from $35 to $50, United States dollars, to do an international wire. But here comes Bitcoin, where now I can send value globally in two minutes to five minutes, and it will cost me $2, right? So not only am I saving more than 10 times, but I'm also saving on time. A typical wire will take you three days. But now I can do this in three minutes, right? So again, all of these values is essentially where we are today and Bitcoin we're seeing it now as this uh, widely globally accepted uh, store of value means of exchange to the point where we're seeing countries adopt it, uh, right? So, so I think it's very important that we sort of remember, because I think that's what this is all about, really to remember where we're coming from. I remember the, the fundamentals that, that, that is driving this adoption that we are now uh, celebrating. So we've seen these uh, blockchain in terms of in, in finance with Bitcoin. And I think the challenge you and I have here today is to say, what is the future? What else can be built on top of a technology like this, right? I mean, uh, Chris Elion talked about NFTs and, uh, you know, all of these great things that are, are being built already, right? I think especially in Africa, uh, there's a lot of opportunity for things like, you know, land ownership registration or even identity registration that could in, in the future be used for voting. There's all of this greatness, because remember at the end of the day, we're talking about a public distributed ledger, uh, ledger or database. What else can be built on it? I, I think the, for, 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 for all intensive purpose, the, 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 the truth is that it's, 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 in, in, it's the, the possibilities are infinite. And that's where you and I come in, in place, is to think outside the box and start building uh, this future. Again, Chris went over this earlier on, but again, I'm, I'm just going to go over it uh, in summary, right? I, I, again, for us to understand the beauty of Bitcoin, for us to appreciate Bitcoin and blockchain, I think it's, we have to understand money, right? I think if you understand the history of money, if you understand what value is, if you understand uh, the, 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 what it means for the exchange of value and the economics behind that, it's easy to understand Bitcoin. It's easy, easy to appreciate Bitcoin. I think for you to understand sort of uh, the where we're going to now with the whole idea of Web3 and ownership mentality and uh, data and owning your data and things like that, and how we can own that data and use that data and share it as we please in different kinds of application, it's important that we understand the history of the internet, right? Uh, again, we started off with Web 1, think about them as static pages, right? Pages you can read, right? Read only, you can see them. They're just static pages, not much you can do with it. It's information for, for you know, to keep it easy. Then we moved on to Web 2, where we start talking about read and write. So now, not only can you read an article, you can add to the article with a blog. Now you can blog and publish your information. You can write, right? Uh, social media, you can create accounts, you can interact with it, you can create events, you could you can now not only read this data, you could read and write, right? And then we moved on to that to, to Web3, where, where, where uh, it's currently being built. And I think there's a, a 
a, a slew of opportunities uh, for us developers, uh, corporations to really see how do we evolve this, right? So, so Web3 now we're talking about not only read, right, but the idea of ownership. Right. We talked about the whole idea of privacy issues with, you know, we saw Cambridge Analytica come out and it's like, what if you could own your data and what if you could share it to the limit of which you needed? What if you could own your asset and truly own it where nobody else could, could have a hold on that? Right. And that, that's where we are today in terms of uh, the growth. But there's so much that could be done with that. Right, uh, there's so 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 much that could be done with that. So I, I think it's important as developers we start thinking about where we're coming from, the issues that we solved, where we are, and where we could potentially go. Right now, that brings me to sort of like where we are in terms of an organization, GIGX. Uh, our goal is to say, look, over the years, uh, individuals, corporation, look at the internet for example. Look at the top ten richest people in the world, top twenty richest people in the world you will notice that a huge majority of them, their wealth was as a result directly or indirectly from the birth and the growth of the internet. Uh, we believe that over the next decade, over the next two decades, um, the new wealth class are going to be people who have created or generated or have their wealth impacted greatly by blockchain, directly or indirectly. And I think it's important that for us Africans, we want more of, uh, I mean, our people to, to benefit from this technology, to, to connect to this technology. And that's one of the things that we are passionate about uh, when it comes to our organization. So we always say, how are we going to, not just onboard the next million users, because that's just the first step, but how do we onboard, and not just us, like an individual company, but as a, as a group of you know, developers, companies, other organizations, individuals that are passionate to change and shape the world, how do we onboard the next 10 million, 100 million, a billion users into a blockchain-based environment that can help them uh, protect not only their data, their privacy, but also to make an impact on them financially, right? How do we do that? So GIG Expat, essentially what we are is a neo bank for cryptocurrency assets i mean today in today's world uh, you have the your banks where you go you can save you can earn interest you can do cross-border transfers you can do all of these things but we believe that the future is digital we believe that cryptocurrency is going to play a primary role in the future so we are saying why not build the bank for the future and that's essentially what we have we have done is to build a cryptocurrency bank that is focused on digital assets only so everything you could do on the bank or with a bank, you could do on our platform. You can save your money. You could earn interest with your savings account. I mean, we just released a feature for the high interest savings account that pay as much as three times what the traditional banks uh, pays, right? And, and ways where you can even hedge your savings against the local currency devaluation, right? So, I mean, every, getting a, a, a loan, uh, investing in real world assets, those are some of the features that we are providing. Like I said, everything that you could do with your traditional bank, we are providing this opportunity uh, to, to, to everyone globally, starting first with, with, with Africa, uh, uh, to be able to do that with digital assets. Now, our, our mission is very simple, to be the gateway to economic freedom for, for, for many by being the access point to the world of decentralized finance across Africa. Now, the whole idea uh, around decentralized finance is how without, again, the middleman, how do we leverage this blockchain technology, this peer-to-peer -peer technology in a sense, uh, Web3 style, to provide value. So from earning interests on your, your deposits, to be able to take loans, to be able to do, uh, using your, 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 your assets to, to, to invest in real world assets. These are things we want to be able to onboard Africa into a decentralized finance world. Now, some of the things that we provide is a multi-purpose digital wallet. And, and this, by the way, is actually active. So I do encourage everyone on the call to, I mean, it takes less than two minutes, right? Go to your app store, download the app, play around with it, take a look at it. Um, I mean, we put a lot of love uh, into this. And, and beyond that, we truly believe it is something that will, will change the world. It is something that will positively uh, impact uh, Africa. So 
It's a multi-purpose digital wallet application and it enables users to use their local currency to be onboarded into a blockchain world, use their local currency to buy into these digital assets. So you can buy digital assets. You can sell your digital assets back for uh, local currency. So we're talking about full liquidity provision. You can come in anytime, you can get out anytime. You could store these assets in terms of custodianship. And again, this custodianship are insured custodianship. Uh, you could swap one token one for another. You could send it to a friend. You could send it across the globe, right? You could borrow against it. You could earn interest uh, with it. And most importantly, one of the, the unique features that, that we have done is how there's always been this gap between the real world and the digital world. And I, I think that when we, go, we got into the space, you know, when you think about Bitcoin, I think about crypto assets, it's always been very digital. It's always been very, okay, I can't see it, I can't feel it. So one of the, the, the problems that we are also looking to solve is to bridge a gap, to be a bridge between the real world and the digital world. Now, how do we allow and enable digital currency holders to use their digital currency to invest in real world? Right, this real world assets, think about things like real estate, think about things like transportation, logistics, Transportation is one of the biggest industry uh, across Africa because most people go, you know, from place to place. Um, urbanization is growing at an accelerated rate, right? So it doesn't matter if people are going by air, people are going by land. People are migrating, people are moving from place to place. Imagine if being in a blockchain-based environment, so being in a digital position, you could also earn from this real-world activity. Now, all of a sudden, it's not just, just this digital, I can't place it. It is now something that... The, the values being generated in, in, in combination with real world activities, right? And a lot of this can be leveraged using non-fungible tokens or NFTs and, and smart contracts. So these are some of the, the features that we see that we're currently building. Uh, and I think that uh, a lot of people on this call, again, being developers, uh, it's important to share this with you as well. So as you think along, you see the, the opportunity in the future, it, it, is, it is wild, it is, it is there. Right, we have a chance to essentially build the world or, or create the future. Right, I uh, wanted the, the you know Chris talked about the fact that uh, Nigeria and, Ga uh, and Kenya are ranked as one of the highest when it comes to using Bitcoin for cross border. Again, this is a problem that you know has, has been there for, for for years. But now, imagine being able to do this right from your app. I mean, for those on the call who are from Nigeria, you know how it is right now trying to get foreign currency. You have to know some guy, or I mean, the banks most likely wouldn't even have the liquidity for you. You have to go to the black market and it just gets complex. But imagine from the comfort of your home, from your cell phone, you can leverage that market. And now you can transact and send value globally, right? You can see on the image, they will say, distance is no longer a barrier, right? Because from the comfort of your home, you can now transact with your suppliers, you can do business globally. You now truly become a global citizen. So that's it, guys, uh, about, about us, about what we see in the space, uh, what we think uh, is going on, and what we think the, the future could be. But one thing I know is that you and I get to build this future. So something that I was super excited about, uh, like I said, our app is up. I do strongly encourage everyone to take a look at it. It's GIGX Pad um, on the App Store, same as the Play Store, right? Get started, you know. Uh, you know, if you have any feedback, you know, you, you sent us usually actually for referral code, you can use the referral code JGX Smallers and uh, my, my first name, JGX Osumede, it'll get you in. Uh, you know, we'd, we'd love to hear from you, we'd love to connect. But beyond that, I think it's important. Um, you know, a mentor of mine once told me that, you know, first you, you, you get started because you must take action, right? Then you have to learn, you have to grow. And more important, it's important to share. So if, if you have been onboarded into the cryptocurrency world and you're finding value, I think it's important to, to, to tell a friend, to tell a family member, right? Each one teach one. And I think that, you know, that will truly lead us to the, the Africa of our dreams, to, to that, that new Africa that we could all be proud of, our children can be proud of. And uh, yeah, that's, that's, that's my time here today. More than happy to, to uh, take any questions. Thank you. Well, thank you for the speak, Osame. And a question uh, from our audience, Henry, for you, is that from what you mentioned, you we know that the GIGX is Africa's first um, decentralized marketplace, bringing real-world business opportunities to a blockchain-based environment. So how um, GIGX plays his unique role in the blockchain space and what GIGX GX has already changed or plan to change Africa economics in the past or maybe in the future. 
So I think the very first thing that our goal is, is to first onboard. Like we said, um, majority of, it's crazy because I look at a list uh, at stats and it says, you know, Nigeria is the fourth largest user of Bitcoin in the world. And I still walk around and it still seems like 90% of people still don't even own the asset class. So I think our first job is to educate more of Africa about this opportunity. Because a lot of people use money today, but they truly really don't understand what is money. What is this idea of transacting value from place to place? So I think there's a big role in educating people about value, about money, about the future of money, about inflation, protecting themselves from inflation and devaluation, right? Planning for the future, building a hedge around themselves and their families so that in the future, they will have a place there, right? So that's our very first job is to educate more of the market. And our second job is to now onboard them. We, we talk about Web3. Web3 is great. I mean, we have components of Web3 that we are currently integrating into our business model. But before people can even get into Web3, guess what? They have to be comfortable with Web2. They, before you tell people to uh, you know, have their own private keys and use this decentralized platform, they first have to be able to just log in and buy Bitcoin. So I think that's our very first goal is to educate them. Second goal is to onboard them. Third goal is to bring them deeper into the blockchain world, leveraging things they are already familiar with. So what do we mean? For example, people already save money in the bank. They already earn a return. They already understand what it means to save and earn. Now we can leverage DeFi without saying DeFi and confusing them. But now people can save their local currency. But now because you're saving in USDC or USDT or UST, it's hedged against the dollar. And you could earn an interest that is greater than your currency's local value, right? So now we can now start introducing them to concepts in DeFi. Then they get comfortable with it. Then we introduce them to things to say, hey, you're already familiar with owning a real estate. You're already familiar with uh, the transfer business. You probably travel from place to place. How about using this thing called an NFT bot rather than complicating it with NFTs? Say, hey, you can own ownership in this this DAO, this system that runs this transport business. And every time the, the vehicles go from point A to point B, the DAO gets paid. But because you are a part owner in this DAO through your NFT or through your token, you actually earn and benefit from that growth. So the idea is that you're bringing them through the full value chain. Because remember, all of this concept, DeFi, NFTs, Web3, the, the foundation that makes it work is the blockchain. So that is our goal. And that, that's sort of like the, the, the user's journey that we want to take. Because at the end of the day, you'll find that more people, because you've made it and you've spoken in a language that they understand, they'll end up, you, people are using DeFi on our platform right now. They're saving, but to them, they are saving. But again, the interest is through DeFi, right? So, so that, that's it. I hope that answers the question. Okay, thank you for the answer, also, mate. I uh, really appreciate that. So our last session is the panel discussion. We have um, invited five valuable guests to answer some of the hotspot questions related to blockchains in Africa. And um, the guests are uh, Ms. Chuta from uh, Blockchain Nigeria Group. Ms. Chuta is a passionate and transformative leader, founder of Blockchain Nigeria Group and FinTech Connector Community Partner at Nigeria and advisory board member at Kinesis Money, who is currently pioneering the mass adoption of blockchain in Nigeria and Africa. Hello, Mr. Um, Chuha. Hello, everyone. Um, good afternoon, good evening, good morning from wherever you are. Nice to be here today. Yeah, uh, the, the first question is, as you said in an interview, the blockchain technology doesn't matter unless it helps people. So could you please talk a little bit on the current blockchain market in Africa and how blockchain technology can help to improve people's life in Africa? All right, thank you so much for the opportunity once again. Um, I came in contact with blockchain technology around 2016 while researching for um, application of 3D printing on a commercial level and I was stumbled you know, I stumbled upon that word blockchain and I decided to gobble it. That was how I began to uh, dig deep 
because I found it as a very innovative tool that could solve um, most of Africa's problems. Because, um, you know, my research on 3D printing was basically on how um, major companies like Boeing and other supply chain management companies were uh, dealing with the issue of fake products and um, they were using 3D printing to assign unique IDs and those unique IDs are embedded on the blockchain for people who buy the parts to be sure that they are receiving genuine parts. And such a technology that could solve or resolve um, on a fundamental level, the issue of trust to me was something that um, we cannot just um, uh, uh, scroll over. You know, I was, I was browsing so I could easily have scrolled past such a job. But I had to stop and say, are you saying that even a big company like Boeing could adopt a technology to deal with the issue of trust? And here you find that in Africa as a whole, trust is one of the key problems that we have because when people don't have um, trust for those in leadership, they cannot work with them. When you are in a relationship where people don't trust you, maybe it's business relationship or any kind of relationship whatsoever, trust is integral. And without trust, it's difficult to you know, gain advantage in any way that you want to in that particular kind of relationship. So I focused on it. And um, back home in Nigeria, I, I looked at how many of Nigeria's problems are rightly or wrongly intertwined around, around the issue of trust. Because one of the things that bring trust is uh, transparency. And um, blockchain technology also in its root carries with it transparency. Actually, is the fact that it's a transparent, immutable record that makes it trusted. Okay, so um, <laughs> when you have transparency and you have immutability and you have um, that trust sorted out, then it's much, much, much easier for you to deal with people, you know, because um, in regions of the world that have advanced, most of them were able to find a way to deal with trust issues, even though there was no blockchain technology. Probably they had some other systems that enabled them. Probably they have um, monitoring systems that work. But back in Africa, we don't have systems. We don't have infrastructure. So there's no way of measuring the level of trust in any way. And it has kept us where we are for so long. And that's why I believe that blockchain technology will do well in Africa more than any other place in the world. I keep saying that because um, this is one time in the history of Africa that not having the right infrastructure, not having the legacy systems, have become an advantage because we could just go straight to utilize blockchain technology and build new systems and apply them to solve the numerous problems that we have everywhere. If you look at the areas that has to do with, um, uh, let's, let's start from tiny issues like electro processes, for instance. As long as the, the electro process is opaque, you cannot trust the outcome of the results of the elections. So, you know, again, you are seeing that you could use blockchain technology to solve a problem like that if there is a willingness in the, hand, in the mind of those who are in authority. Because first of all, you can transparently onboard the, the, the candidates that want to contest the elections. You can transparently onboard the eligible voters. Then you can transparently also create a process for the election itself and the result will also be transparent and everything will just work the way it's supposed to work in a civilized world okay then you move over from electoral process you go through issues that has to do with certification either certification of uh, of um, academic qualifications that you obtain from an institution or certification that you obtain from a certifying body or a certification that you got from as a position, you know, a proof of ownership of something. You know, the entire issue of certification, whatever and however you want to look at it, in most African countries shows that they are not trust trustworthy. I mean, people can't understand 
why we are where we are. Because you see someone who didn't do well in school, but he could actually forge his results and he gets um, promoted to be the managing director of a company. Or he gets advanced in life above those who are actually um, intelligent enough, smart enough to manage things. And there's no way he can prove. Okay, so that's a major problem. So if you try to look at every aspect of Nigeria's, if I, every Africa, aspect of Africa's problem, you trace this issue of lack of trust. And that is something that is coming directly from the fact that we don't have any confidence in the government or in any system for that. It's not just government. Even when you go to private companies and entities, many of them don't have transparent processes that they follow. So I see, and I believe that um, it's the right approach. Blockchain will not be useful except it solves problems. It solves problems. Yes, in the very first uh, experimentation of this technology, there has been a whole lot of focus on the financial uh, aspect in the industry where um, people are paying most, which is in their finances. And we are gradually um, getting it right there. At least we have established the fact that there is an alternative financial system. That alternative financial system could work for anyone anywhere in the world. So he has no enemy. So you cannot say that I don't like crypto, I don't like Bitcoin, I don't like blockchain technology. Because if you say that, sooner or later you're going to need it. Because I have in one of the conferences that I, I, I spoke with recently, I, I made a statement and I say that um, Bitcoin, when we say Bitcoin, Bitcoin, we, we generally use it as an acronym for crypto. So Bitcoin is like water. There's a Nigerian musician in Nigeria who died a couple of years ago. His name is Fela. He sang a song. He says that water, no get enemy. That is water has no enemy. So that is what Bitcoin is. It has no enemy. And if you want to um, uh, prove what I'm saying, look at in the regions where we have conflicts in the world today, in uh, Russia, in Ukraine. Both the aggressed and the aggressor or the aggressee is utilizing crypto for their own good. Ukraine is using crypto to raise millions and millions of dollars to enable them to buy a whole lot of things that they want on the black market. Russia is using cryptos to circumvent the, uh, the, 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 the sanctions that have been put across by Europe and America and different parts of the world against them. Okay, so you see, the, 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 no one who say that crypto is bad for him. So it's good for everyone, depending on when you need it. And back home in Africa here, we, we have to do a whole lot of work. I, I, I appreciate what Osamida was saying, that the need for education. Yes, we've been doing quite a lot of education, but of course, that education is not something that is in its finality. Neither is it exhaustible. Yes, what you are hearing and you're seeing today about Nigerians being involved in crypto in a massive way, even seeing a lot of startups building, building applications coming out from Nigeria and across Africa in their in their hoods is because of massive efforts that have been put in place over the last three, four, five years ago to bring the discussions around this uh, uh, technology to for for everyone to be able to understand what they are, how they can apply them, and what they can use them for. So. Going back to what I was saying about blockchain can only be useful except it solves problems. I still insist on that because it's obvious that in different aspects of our lives, we are going to continuously discover that the missing puzzle, the missing element is that transparency which breeds trust. And that's why I encourage most people who are building up applications, we have problems that we have across Africa. You get to solve them with these tools. We have to solve unemployment with technology tools of blockchain. We have to solve electro electoral problems. We have to solve record keeping. Look at how easy it is in Nigeria and across Africa for people to, to um, do 
land racketing. There are no records that are immutable, that are provable that people who own lands actually own them. You may have a piece of paper in your hand given to you with a, a seal or a letter heading of uh, a land registry authority. But at the land registry authority itself, you may not be the owner that the name is mapped out to that particular piece of property. And because we don't have these kinds of transparent records, it becomes extreme easy, extremely easy to un unlock the potentials of, of the, the, the wealth that is locked up in our lands. Because nobody trusts your papers. Even if a, a bank wants to give you a loan, he needs to spend a lot of time and money to go doing some kind of uh, uh, investigation and verification before they can verify that you're actually the true owner. But majority don't have that, uh, that opportunity. So I, if we can talk about the problems that we have in Nigeria that blockchain can solve till tomorrow morning, because it's just everywhere. And that's why I encourage developers to, to, to look beyond finance. Look beyond finance. Look at other areas. Look at how we can build talents that could be useful also in the emerging future. Because we have high rate of unemployment. Our GDP is too low compared to the people that live in different parts of the world. I once saw uh, uh, a, a, an indices that measured how early or how quickly different people living in different jurisdictions of the world can buy iPhone 13 released by Apple. And you find out that honest labor by an average Nigerian may take him three years before he can buy it. Why people in Japan or probably somebody in Australia who afford to buy it this very month that iPhone 13 came out? And those are the result of poor GDP. Those are the result of poverty. That's why it takes us a long time. I mean, if, if, if you look around you, if you look, live in Lagos or you, you live anywhere in Nigeria, you look around you, look at how old the cars are that you find around you. The reason why people are still buying cars in Nigeria is because there are a lot of accidented vehicles all over the world and they are all being shipped down to Nigeria. Otherwise, how many Nigerians can walk into a car shop and it doesn't even matter how the model of the vehicle that they want to buy walk into a car shop and say, okay, I want to buy this car, car that is here, brand new. I mean, you can't boast up to 5% of Nigerians that can do that. Our roads are filled with, with abandoned and, and uh, accidented vehicles. And that's a result of poverty. So we need to catch in on this technology at this early age to multiply its impact, to solve up unemployment problem, to solve low income problem. Most people who are fortunate to work in the blockchain space, work in crypto in the last couple of years, many of them have tested what it means to be on a global standard of pay. You don't have to be, uh, uh, be earning very little because you are in Lagos or in Nigeria. If you increase your knowledge and your value is appreciated. You'll be paid like they pay every other person anywhere in the world. And that's what I have seen and experienced personally. And I've seen a whole lot of people. I know a couple of people who we help to train in blockchain development who are earning six, seven, ten thousand dollars $10,000 every single 30 days. And these are the realities. If we can increase the number of people that can earn that much within our own polity, our problems will drastically begin to reduce because there are different routes to success. You may keep waiting for government and their budgeting to be able to solve the problems of poverty in Nigeria, and you could wait till the next 100 years, and you will live and die, and you never get that thing to work out for you. But you could take, take the other route that the centralized economy has brought for us. Blockchain, crypto, metaverse, NFTs, and every one of these new techs, VR and every augmented reality. You could decide to run your own race, take advantage of these technologies, and change your life, change your destiny, change the destiny of everyone in your, in your lineage completely. Because, <laughs> I mean, first of all, we are individuals. 
And if our government continue to fumble and not have willing to, willingness to solve, the, there are certain problems that only government willingness can solve. No matter how we desire, no matter how we want to show it, only the willingness of the government and those in authority can solve it. I know how many years we've been walking around, going to the, the Security and Exchange Commissions, talking to them at CBN, talking to them at uh, NIDA, to put out a standard document, policy document, regulatory framework that will help this industry to take off when everywhere else is taking off. <laughs> you can take a whole stream, but you can't force it to drink. They delayed until Financial Action Tax Force had to threaten Nigeria with listing, with gray listing, if they don't provide crypto-based reports in their 2021 um, uh, assessment of financial transactions. Now they're all running away, kitikata, you know, trying to gather some kind of report. But two years ago, they would have had documents ready to get these uh, doc, uh, 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 reports available to whoever needs it. So I don't want to waste too much of take too much of our time. And uh, I'm sure I'm speaking to each one of you from my heart. I didn't want to use a slide because I, I, I don't fully understand the kind of people that we are having in the meeting tonight. But I believe speaking from your heart and then um, dealing with the issues that directly will be impactful to you is the route to go. And that's why I have done that. So thank you so much. I appreciate it. If you have any questions, you have anything at all that you think that we should uh, talk about, please go ahead and, um, and let's discuss those. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Um, Chuta. It seems like uh, the rest of the guests are here. And let me introduce them one by one. We have uh, Mr. Ihes. He's the leader of Conflex Africa and um he's the regional marketing and business lead he has a master degree in international economics and business from nankai university and we have mr Osamade. he is the co-founder of gigx and um he's an investment fund manager author and educator mr Osamade's mission is very simple is to share as much possible about how to create wealth protect it grow it grow it and pass it on to the next generation. We have Mr. Francis. He is the CEO and co-founder of Cassava Network. And Mr. Francis um, is also the former uh, CEO at Lead Wallet. And we also have Mr. Gaius here. Um, Gaius is a Nigerian businessman and he's one of the Africa's most influential pioneers in cryptocurrencies trading, particularly in Bitcoin. So um, also uh, there are plenty of questions here. Um, the next one is um, what is the current ecosystem distribution of blockchain in Africa and how we could promote it? So um, who, who, who won't take this question? Um, maybe Mr. Um, Osame, do you want to answer this question? Okay, so I'm not sure I understand the question fully. What's the current distribution? Yeah, um, probably is um, how, what, what like the the um, distributions for um, the, the the trade or the um, education, something like this. I think. Uh, I think just like Mr. Chuta said, uh, the from the education standpoint, there's still a lot of work to be done. But one thing that I am taking uh, a lot of joy in is that I see a lot of more platform now, especially a lot of the exchanges getting into the education space as well. So, uh, so, so that's it. Then in terms for the other side of things, I think the biggest focus today as is uh, in Nigeria is more or less on the trading side. So a lot of the applications we are seeing today when it comes to blockchain and comes to cryptocurrency in general will be more or less on the trading side so it's still very it's still very much the introductory side side of things introductory meaning educating users about the space and then onboarding them to the space 
So I'm not sure if that was the question, but if that is it, that's the answer. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. And um, there's another question about um, how, what what would you recommend it to Africans who want to work in the crypto areas or industries? Um, Mr. Ehase, do you want to take this question? Okay, great. I can take that. Um, so if you want to work in the blockchain space, I mean, you first have to like learn um, what you, you want to do, like know what you want to do. Um, know where you want to fit into. I mean, there are many, there are several places, several aspects in the blockchain space you can work in. You don't have to be a developer, um, as um, uh, Mr. Tutor said in his um, in his speech. You don't really have to be a developer to work in the blockchain space. There are many opportunities. You can be a writer. You can um, you can do all sorts. You know, you can be a business development manager, um, like myself. You can do all all these opportunities in, in the blockchain space. I mean, and then there is opportunity for the space to grow. You know, there's opportunity for the space to grow um, in a massive way. So right now there is just limited people um, trying to push the space to the public. So we need all the power, all the manpower we can get into the space. So you just have to know where you want to fit into and what you do best, and then um, take it up from there. Okay, thank you. Um, uh, Mr. Francis, do you want to answer um, how blockchain technology can shape the future of Africa's digital economy? And do we have like regulations um, of the blockchains and what, what challenges and opportunities we see in, in, the, um, in such areas? Yeah, thank you so much for the opportunity to speak. So um, when we talk about regulations, right, I think that Mr. Chuta is the ogre when it comes to regulation because he's making all the big moves and, you know, trying to make sure that Nigeria, you know, stays crypto friendly, you know, and properly regulated. So I give that to him so much in, in the work he's doing there. So then generally when, sorry, I need to look at that question one more time. Can you read it for me again so I don't just don't answer off point? Uh, what number is it? But, uh, Can you do you mean the questions again? Yes, the I'm question, sorry. please confirm the number for me. So I'll just read okay. It. The question is what um, challenges or opportunities do we see um, in, in the economic areas? Like, do we, do we need regulations for them or, or what? Okay. Okay, 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 okay. So the question of regulation when it comes to crypto for me, like I would always say, we really don't need regulation in the crypto space. It's my personal opinion, but if we if we take it further, you know, looking at history, especially how the um, previous speakers have looked at where um, the, what the global finance started from and where we are right now, you find out that both money, both economies have always had some sort of regulations starting from maybe the days of the butter system down to when we started using curry, gold, and then paper money. Paper money is heavily regulated with one single authority and, you know, they are annexed approved bodies, minting money the way they like and when they feel they should, and then taking it out of the economy when they feel they should as well. So at the end of the day, you find out that despite all of these regulations governing the current financial system, fraudulent activities still happen every day in fact record still proves that the highest number of um, fraudulent financial activities when you compare it to crypto still remains with fiat so drug dealers um, traffickers you know kidnappers and all of that can easily move money out of in and out of a fiat system without any form of you know record or discovery despite all the unlimited um, regulatory um, points that are out there in, in in the financial space but for crypto you find out that given that it's a trustless system it's somewhat self-regulating how you will know crypto is self-regulating is when you take the concept of bitcoin for instance or as as an operational network you you find out that as an operational network that is bitcoin Despite all the several, you know, attempts to hack the network, it's always proves, it always proves impossible. At best, what happens or what hackers will do is that they will hold 
um sway to your um crypto wallet and um, passphrase or um private key and then interact with your own wallet that is the amount of money in your wallet balance maybe send it out or spend it but in terms of maybe bringing harm to the network you just realize that it's not possible to bring harm to the network because the network self-regulates itself the miners that are there are there to protect the network because they know that they have a lot at stake if they try to you know um, uh, make make the uh, network unsecure right that's um one way i want us to look um to look at it then another way we need to look at this um um regulatory thing is um when we talk about the government for instance government is best at leading political related matters social services you know taking care of um, um re 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 making regulatory policies that govern the health sector and all of that when it comes to finance especially when you look at the different types of economic system we have socialism capitalism and the rest of it you also realize that except for a very few countries and even in that countries government is still doing a bad work when it comes to regulating the economies of the different countries so the best form of economy for me is always that free market uh, system where buyers and sellers can exit at any point in time and then prices are set on the basis of what both the buyers and the sellers find interesting you see so again i don't think that regulation is one big of a deal but if the general public or the crypto community continues to think that um, regulation is the way to go well of course, I'm a law-abiding citizen and whatever regulatory compliance that will be there for us to follow will definitely follow. But as a system, this system can actually thrive. You know, if you look at maybe scammy activities that have happened over the years till now, you find out that for every successful scam or a failed scam, people tried to you know protect themselves further and then when maybe an ill activity is brought into the network it's just affecting a, a small portion of people that is those people who are involved in that thing the entire network is not meant to suffer compared to when you have a regulatory system that governs the entire network or government tells you we are the one who tells you when to do this or we are the one who tells you how to do this you find out that one single mistake just like the banks that you know now bank control everything that relates to how you store how you save your money and how you spend your money but most often the, at times than not you come to realize that these banks you know encounter different kinds of fraudulent cases and even their their uh, board of directors and you know managers who are part of these banks are big fraudsters who use their customers money for different kinds of shady deals and then they hide under the regulatory framework that says for instance the bank has the right to spend 90 percent of customers funds right in the form of investment or in the form of loan um, issue out then when the when when the bank comes crashing instead of it to just affect only the bank owners you find out that even the customers who are storing their money in those banks are also being affected so in a nutshell regulatory question or regulatory framework it's an argument that will never end but if we open our mind up and really think about what this network or this technology is all about you find out that regulation is not what we need for it what we just need for the crypto space in my opinion is to keep making it technically better and better and better which is codes the codes are the proof that things will either go wrong or go right thank you well, thank you, Mr. Francis. Um, really appreciate your explanation. And our last question for uh, Mr. Chuda is, what key points would you like to tell to crypto traders and how the developer can start their Web3 journey? Okay. Um, thank you for so much for the question. Yeah, crypto traders are pretty um, enjoying the boom because um, there's no asset class that is valuable in the world that people don't speculate, even real estate, people speculate them and they make a whole lot of money. And um, there's no law that can stop that anywhere in the world. Now, uh, one of the things they must ensure is that, look, um, you just have to play by the rules. Everybody has his own opinion. But, you know, regulation in the industry we are talking about is not actually a regulation of crypto as a technology or as an asset. You know, we need to regulate how people deal with this asset class in the um, 
you know, community of humans where we find ourselves. If you don't regulate um, anything, people are going to be um, behaving in a way that will also jeopardize other people. You can imagine if there's no regulation on how you can drive your car. There's no transport regulation, you know, or there's no regulation of building. People can just use one bag of cement and mold like uh, 2,000 blocks and use them build a house and tell people to leave. They will just use sticks as pillars. You know, if there's no regulation in football, somebody will just say, okay, we have 15, now let's play. Shabuna day four is enough. And you have 15 people on one side. And there will not be anything like, let's agree on what should be a foul play. Okay, so regulation is part of what helps civilization and organization of life. And in this case of crypto, is not the technology itself that we are talking about regulating. It is the operation and how people relate with one another in the course of doing any of this. Most of the things that uh, Obasi said also are happening in crypto. People people have trusted wallet issuers. People have trusted exchanges. People have trusted, trusted uh, project issuers, token issuers. And they took advantage of people. So you cannot, we are not in the, in the jungle where it's a you know, survivor for the fittest. You know, government comes in to help make it easy for people who, who cannot fight for themselves so that they can have um, a clear pathway they will follow. Then on the issue of um, web developers transitioning to um, blockchain developers, because I like to look at it that way, because most of the time you find that people who are traditionally already ingrained in software development, most of them, if they really know what they are doing, most of them are not likely to leave what they are doing to um, jump into blockchain development. Very, very unlikely. I try that, you know, personally, I have a background in web application development. So I try to bring in some of our friends who were into traditional software development. And I found that it's to them, it's not one of the things that they want to do, you know, to jeopardize the work that they are doing. Because those who are really good are really properly engaged. So the only place where you can get people who can quickly, you know, um, be turned into blockchain developers is when you look at those who are already conversant with building web applications using tra traditional web technologies of CSS. JavaScript and HTML. Okay, so they already understand how the web works. So Web3 is just an additional layer on top of the existing web. So they already know what it is. So there you find a large chunk of people that you can easily turn into blockchain developers within a very short period of time. And that journey is usually um, very, 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 very easy if there is a lot of commitment. Because unlike traditional web, where we didn't have resources available early for people to learn, Web3 technology has tons of information already available. So people are creating content already on the internet. And you can start that journey. And within three months, six months, you sure to be a mid-level uh, mid uh, developer. And that's actually a good thing to do. But for many others who are not technically inclined, you don't have to um, you know, split your head about being a blockchain developer. Actually, blockchain developers are only occupying about 15% of roles that are available in the blockchain industry. There are tons of other people doing other things that are extremely important. They are, they are, every day, there is need for um, researchers, there are need for... Uh, marketers, their need for writers, their need for lawyers, their need for um, uh, forensic investigators, their need for for, uh, for auditors. You just name it. Every other area that is non-technical abound, and it's just for you to discover that. And that will be the easiest way you can change your destiny. Thank you very much. Um, thank you, Miss Judah, and thank you everyone here today. Um, here, I guess, is the end of the day one. And if still have questions, please feel free to join our Telegram group. Also, you may now start to form your team and we'll send the team roster in the Telegram group as well. And don't forget to register your team members on the roster.
for the giveaway prizes, we have prepared six um, legendary popes for those who attend the bootcamp from week two to week four. And the campus who collect all six popes will get a chance to join our giveaway lottery in week four. So make sure you're filling the forms in the Telegram group to get the free cash. Finally, a quick reminder for tomorrow's schedule, and we will have topics related to how could blockchain technology contribute to Africa's infrastructure. It will be tons of knowledge, so make sure you don't miss it. Again, thank you for everyone today, and the lectures are really amazing. And we will see you guys tomorrow. You guys have a wonderful night. Bye-bye. All right, bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all the best.